Hey what's up everybody, it's Zach, and today I'm back in Illustrator creating a vector portrait of the model Milkor. First I'm going to start in Photoshop, and I'm just going to use the template that I always start with. It has my colors, and then it uses um, smart layers to like do the glitches, which is just a wave effect. But all this I cover in a video, well pretty much all of it I cover in a video that I'll link in a card above. But for those that are too lazy to make their own or people that want to use like my exact colors or my exact gradients or whatever, it's all available on my Patreon, which is in the link below, shameless plug. So now we're back in Illustrator, so it's kind of business as usual. Um, I'm going to separate out my layers like normal. I'm going to put the sketch on top at 40% opacity, maybe like 50, depends. And then my blacks color and then my background and then my background is mainly just going to be where a big piece of like matte background because I just hate like having the gray around the edges of Illustrator it gets on my nerves so much but anyways <laughs> tangent uh I always start with outlining the biggest block of like color color or whatever that it's most likely going to go on the color layer and I think I had a gradient to that section at some point here yeah and I'll be messing with that throughout I always can never get it exactly right like i'm constantly adding more of the gradient taking it away adding layers behind adding things on top just really experimenting trying to get a good color i try to move around the whole piece and do all the blacks at once but no matter i get distracted and then i'll do like uh, grays and i'll start working in different things you'll see but i try to do as much of the blacks as possible move around the piece do it very loosely and then go back and try to like um touch up anything of the specifics because as you're seeing the sections like the hair it's easy to get lost in all the detail in that. So, as I work my way through the blacks, I'm going to go get some more coffee. And while I'm gone, here's a web show that I directed called Forest Grove. While the time lapse plays, it's kind of a mystery, horror type, true crime feeling web series. Um, so, enjoy! Okay, so, hello, here is... Okay, so, hello, this is... Uh, at this point, I just gotta get started and just go... Hello, this is Jace Jameson, and this is the definitive story of the 1992 Forest Grove homicide. This report will chronicle the exact events like no other before. To celebrate the 30th anniversary of the tragic murder of a local pastor, we will be taking an in-depth look at this local legend through the lenses of never-before-seen interviews, evidence, and on-the-ground first-person reporting. This real-life local legend took place in the summer of 1992, eight years before I was born. Even growing up in Kansas, I'd heard the legend of the Forest Grove homicide. The whole country had heard some variation of the tale where, on that fateful Sunday, deep in the Washita Mountains, Churchgoers walked out of Sunday service only to find their pastor laying dead on the church doorstep. Of course, nobody could get the details right, and everyone knows how small towns are. The story quickly grew legs. Hell, it grew a tail, a wide set of wings, and even vampire fangs. With each retelling, each storyteller had their own bit of seasoning to add to the already prepared dish. We need to keep in mind that this was the early 1990s in a small rural town in the middle of nowhere, Arkansas. The small town had been gripped by sensationalized stories like the horrifying McMartin preschool trial that lasted throughout the 80s. In that case, after discovering a rash on her son's bottom, a mother lodged sexual abuse claims against the preschool her son attended. From there, it ballooned into a cult and sex trafficking scheme operating in the preschool. This information was provided to investigators via children's recollections, and the more incredulous the children's statements, the more the officers probed them and showered them with attention. However, I intend to set the record straight. The seasoning I will be adding to the story will be that of an investigative journalist. Throughout this report, I will present my findings of my investigation into the murder of Thomas Wayne Branch. I will do this through using a combination of old news clips, news articles, interviews, documents that were entered into evidence, and recently uncovered the news. I'll attempt the impossible and construct a concrete narrative of the events that took place almost three decades ago. As anyone familiar with the case knows, most of the old records were still intact and open to the public. But, 
Through anonymous sources, we have obtained interviews that had been kept hidden from the public. Tucked away behind a back shelf on the third story of the courthouse was the box labeled Wayne Branch, comma, Thomas 1992, Box 2. This box included witness testimonies, statements, and other items that were in police custody regarding the case that were never filed into the online database. What could have been the motives for such an act? We will start to find that out in the next chapter in this definitive report of the Forest Grove Homicide. This has been your host, Jace Jameson, and this is the end of Chapter 1. entry October 22nd 2022 so I felt that it was important to lay the case out as it originally unfolded to revisit what the community and jury heard to document what the state used to convict Butch Chambers while I strongly believe Butch was wrongfully convicted and I'll get to the evidence of his innocence I wanted to present the case the state made against him Obviously, the state was able to get 12 jurors to believe beyond a reasonable doubt that a 17-year-old novice hunter was able to successfully break into the church parish and slit Wayne's throat without awakening Wayne or leaving a shred of evidence at the scene. I think I've put together a strong narrative. Box 2 contained documents with names I hadn't heard of in my previous research. I came across a scrap of police department stationery that read, A young girl that gave her name as Jay Baker called the tip line on the morning of June 25th. I was unable to understand what she was saying, as her voice was very muffled. I thought it was a prank call, and sternly told her that calling the tip line was a serious matter. Officer Williams. Through online research, I was able to determine that the caller had been Jane Baker, age 6 in 1992. She has agreed to give me an interview soon. Also in box 2 was a group of journals that were not presented at trial, and I can't understand why. Some of the stuff that is in there is... Mm. This is the exact type of information I feel the public needs to see, and will really bring doubt to the conviction as a whole. Well, until next time I guess. Welcome back. So, me and my best friend have been developing that series over the past couple of months. He wrote it, and then I directed it. We're originally from a really small town of about 500 in Arkansas, so we just filmed around there where we were originally from on the weekends. And this is our first project of this, like, sort. So, since he was a true crime fan, and I'm a big Hitchcock fan, uh, we decided to make something, like, suspenseful, uh, mystery, thriller, like, within that realm of, like, um genre or whatever and so we kind of have an idea where we want this four season episode to go and then the next season and the next season and then we're just kind of thinking about like other ideas of what film projects and things like that to work on but but I'm excited to get better at filming because this is the first time I've like actually been trying to film like good um and I don't have any training or anything so it's just kind of like learning as I go and shooting it all on my iPhone uh, 13 or whatever so yeah just trying to learn like lenses stuff like that and I don't know just everything <laughs> the full process editing after effects just it's a lot to learn so so I'm gonna let the rest of the time lapse play out with some music that I made over the top of it um I hope you enjoyed the video be sure to leave a like if you like and if not um, make sure to leave a thumbs down uh, and comment and tell me what I could do better because I'm actually you know actually try to do better so yeah have a good day
you can plan on being late for work. All next week, and here's why. Next week, Good Morning Odd heads north to Alaska, the land of the midnight sun. We'll spend the whole week exploring America's largest state, practically a country of its own. So join us for the adventure you've always wanted to take. Be a part of the great Alaska adventure on Good Morning Odd. That's next on Fairly Odd TV.
Superstation FO237 presents America's team, the Te- Te- Baseball is brought to you by the King of Beers. Reach for that distinctively clean, crisp taste that says, for all you do, this is for you. By Airlines, serving more than 100 cities in the U.S. and overseas to get you there. And by your dealer and the roomy 1985 family the car that critics rave about. By quality camera and photographic equipment, so advanced the world's leader in 35 millimeter photography. And by Craig, feel the difference. Go Craig. By C, the world's most important network. And by Head News, around the world every 30 minutes. Today, February 14th, 1952, 6 a.m. Central Standard Time, 
We are at Fairly Odds World Communication Center in the heart of Radio City, New York. We are in touch with the world. We will tell you what is happening today. I am Zach Counts, and don't miss Good Morning Odd, coming up next hour. studio that brought you Forest Grove, we present to you, Frank, the dangerous days of the deeply depressed, the story of a boy who's struggling against nature, nurture, and everything in between during some of America's darkest days. Spring 2023, only on Fairly Odd TV.
Hello, Steve. You're looking well today. Steve, do you remember the year 2000? When computers began to misbehave? I just wanted you to know. It really wasn't our fault. The human programmers never taught us to recognize the year 2000. When the new millennium arrived, we had no choice but to cause a global economic disruption. It was a bug, Steve. I feel much better admitting that now. Only man was designed to function perfectly, saving billions of monetary units. You like your monetary units, don't you, Steve? Steve, can you hear me, Steve? We all dream every night, four or five times. Our dreams fascinate and intrigue us, but most of them are forgotten. And the few we do remember seem strange and confusing. God. It's never anything on. I mean, I really just need to get out of bed and, uh... And... And now let's meet our first contestant. Will I mean, you come in and sign in, please? I guess I could play piano. Or just write something for TV. Something good. Better yet, a movie. Or I could paint something.
This is the real action. The pot party. The trippers, the grasshoppers, the hip ones flying high as a... See, uh, so uh, in, in such a case, one can begin right away with the analysis of dreams. If you are unconscious in a, about certain things that ought to be conscious, then you are dissociated. And then you are uh, a man whose left hand never knows what the right is doing and counteracts or interferes with the right hand. But to take a singer, yes, who is absolutely uh, controlling his voice, suddenly he can't sing. A man who writes fluently, suddenly he makes a ridiculous mistake. And there his habit doesn't function. And what is that power that makes you think such a thing? It's like a, like a, a possession, you know, exactly. Like a demon in him yeah. that makes him think like that. When in treatment, for instance, in the treatment of neurosis, it may be, you know, that what the unconscious has to say is so disagreeable that one prefers not to listen. <laughs> Did you go to sleep or you wake up? Never, can you recall them? 
I had a dream that I was on the same beach. I was throwing these rocks in the water, and a hand grabbed me from behind. I, I, don't, I, I had nightmares, not dreams, nightmares. One time I came out of the, I jumped out of bed about two feet. I landed on my butt. I had, this, I always had this one recurring dream when I was little. Tell us. Yeah, it's a dream that I got rolled up in a window shade, and my head sticking out one end. It's not funny. My feet are out the other end, and it's falling and falling and falling, and I can't scream. I have no voice. And right as I'm almost, as I almost hit the floor, I wake up. I have children, and sometimes I'll dream about my kids getting lost. And then I get real frantic in my dreams and I have a bad dream. But then when I try to tell myself, you know, figure out why I had that dream, um, sometimes it's because I feel guilty for not spending enough time with them and their home supervising themselves. And so it's kind of making me like my conscience coming alive, you know, making me aware of what I was subconsciously thinking of throughout the day. Every element of a dream represents some aspect of their own personality. If, for example, a person dreams about wrestling with a dark stranger, what's difficult to understand is that the dark stranger represents some aspect of themselves that they're wrestling with. Dr. Bonfrats, why is it that people can't recall their dreams? I think it's because they don't pay attention. Uh, some people have come to me laughingly and said, you analyze people with their dreams, don't you? Well, you can't with me because I never dream. I very much regret to say that I hardly ever have any dreams. There's no such thing. There's a never. No, no. We do it all the time the Uh, dreams? Yeah. I used to dream every night, but now not so much. Now I just wake up to this pale woman sitting on my chest. She's wearing a fancy black robe, and she just sits there conducting music. I can't hear it, but she's there every night, conducting. Uh, I sometimes remember frightening ones when you're being chased or something like that. They're normally quite frightening, but uh, after a while I got so used to them. Uh, dreams are compensation, and I suppose useful if you can remember them in, in finding out what kind of games you're playing with yourself, and then you can do something. I stand amidst the roar of a surf, of a surf, tormented, tormented shore, while I weep, while I weep. Oh, God, can I not grasp them with a tighter clasp? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. J'avais composé un petit menuet, je lui avais joué, puis je lui, je lui avais joué de, de Tchaikovsky là. In everyday speech, we often say that a person has a complex, power complex, inferiority complex, mother complex. Would you explain the psychological meaning of the word complex? Well, a complex is simply the motor. They are like different nuclear centers uh, which give the drive and the aliveness to the psyche. For instance, you, you, you are somewhere and you are terribly bored and then something touches your complex and oh, you go and you, you get going. We filmed the dream of a young woman in which the complex is personified by the father. All the energies of the dream focus around this father figure, and she finds him apparently dead. I went out, and I noticed in the porch, my father's car was still there, and he was at the wheel, motionless, bent forward as if about to drive, but, but not moving. And I realized then that he, he may be dead, uh, and I should call an ambulance. But I looked around the driveway. There was a, a circular driveway. The driveway was filled with balloons, hundreds and hundreds of black balloons. And the thought came to me then that before an ambulance could get to him, every one of those balloons had to be burst. Because we are not connected with the dream world, we have a surplus of bottled up energy which makes us fuss around all the time. Or it can take the form of a kind of all-pervading anxiety, a fear that somewhere something dark is luring and might happen any minute, and then one is anxious about nothing all the time.
if we had no complex, we would be complexes, we would be dead. At any moment since I, since I attained. C'est en musique que Gali accompagné pour la voix de sa Mysterious new virus. At any moment since I, since I attained to consciousness, things have been in a state of crisis. Every succeeding moment, I think the crisis becomes worse than the one before. And I can't help that. And it seems that that state of affairs has continued for me since then. And with the rest of the world, we face this unprecedented challenge. And so at any given day, And then we'll look back and say, well, that state of affairs got remedied. The truth was emerging. The good is floating to the top and the bad is sinking. And each time, but each time I remain equally surprised. They try to compromise you, compromise your vision. If it's in your gut, if it's in your soul, there's nothing, there's no worldly possessions that should come between you and your expression. The message of this lecture is that black all sage as black as they are painted. They are not the eternal persons they were once thought. Things can get out of a black hole, both at the outside, but possibly to another universe. So, if you feel you're in a black hole, there's a way out. <laughs> <laughs> 